This is the Meet America podcast, presented by Code 3 Spices, produced by Red Meat Lover. And now your host, Joey and Mike. Hey everybody, welcome to the inaugural episode of Meet America podcast, presented by Red Meat Lover and hosted by Code 3 Spices. My name is Joe Lampy, and this is my co-host, Mike Radosevich of Code 3 Spices. What's up, Mike? What's up, brother? How you doing? Hi. This is a very exciting day for all of us. We've been wanting to do this for a long time, two years in the making. Uh, Code Free Spices and Red Meat Lover and Meat America and Unified Creative Agency finally got together. And we are, we're at the point now where there's no return. We have a good idea what we're doing. Absolutely. We're excited to provide a ton of valuable content to everybody watching. This isn't gonna be your typical podcast at all. Um, for a lot of people that have been following Code 3, they know a little bit about our story. And we're gonna sort of bring you um, very unique, important people that are sort of uncommon, go out of their ways to do great things for other people. Um, people that have overcome a lot of things. Uh, we're gonna be doing a lot of uh, cooking episodes, right? Yum. Uh, product reviews. Can't wait. Uh, we're going to get my main man, Chris Bonemeyer, head pit master of Code 3. He's going to show us um, everything from the competition side of cooking. We're going to do a lot of backyard items. We're going to have some uh, super interesting guests, to say the least. Well, I'm looking forward to that. We actually have a very exciting guest scheduled for our second episode. Can't wait to share that with you. Um, part of the name, the, the story behind the name Meet America is really using meat and uh, cooking, which Mike and I both have a passion for, as a binder that brings the show together and all of our guests, just like a bunch of friends sitting around a grill on a Saturday afternoon. You know, that's why you're there, but oftentimes the conversation goes in a lot of different directions. It does. And uh, our guests, our stories are gonna be, you know, those that are unique to America and that add, that have great stories to tell, as Mike mentioned, doing some product reviews and some cooking and. Um, before we get any further into the format of our show, why don't you tell us a little bit about Code 3 Spices, who you are, and uh, you know how you got started with uh, that. What's your background? Well, uh, born and raised in Collinsville, Illinois, where we're at right now. And right now we're sitting at Old Herald Distillery, um, which is literally probably a seven iron drive. Small town America. Directly that way. Um, Hometown, a lot of history in this town. Old Herald, they've been around for almost a couple of years now. It's a beautiful place. I mean, this, it's really incredible. Um, they're great people here. And uh, we're very fortunate they're allowing us to utilize their space to not only help promote them, but to do Meet America. It's a great product. I'm actually sampling a little uh, Czech Pilsner oh, yeah, right cheers, here. Dude, real quick. Yeah, what do you got there? Uh, I've got some spice rum. All right, salute. Smooth. You smell yours yet? It tastes good. No, I'm talking about spice rum. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait a little bit on the spice rum so we can get um, to it. Code three. What is code three? Um, we're almost eight years old. I was a police officer for 15 years in a town just north of us. Um, I know we're gonna cover this a lot in a future episode. Uh, basically, I was going through an extremely rough time of adversity in my life, personally, and um, as a law enforcement officer. And I needed to get away just to sort of just get away from all the stress that I was dealing with. There was a lot of stress that no human really should all be going through at once. And it was probably my weakest point in time. I was diagnosed with PTSD in 2012. So I was working for another two and a half years throughout this mayhem and chaos that I was dealing with. Um, it wasn't a good time in my life. Um, I consider myself an extremely lucky person. I had two, have two amazing parents. I had a perfect childhood, went to parochial school, uh, went to college high school. I was a three sport athlete, went to college, uh, played baseball at Francis Marion University. Fast forward, got out and became a police officer. Uh, towards the end of my police officer, uh, law enforcement career, as I was saying, I was going through a tough time and cooking was my only getaway to come home. I was working 12 hour shifts. So I was working, you know, only 15 days a month. 
Well, 15 days a month of not having anything to do can lead to trouble if you're not using it creatively or, you know, picking up a hobby. So I've been grilling since I was 18 years old. And I was like, you know what, now's the perfect time for me to come home after a long day of work or a day off and just cook, fire up charcoal, get my kettle going. At the time I had a gas grill as well. I had a little Weber Smoky Mount, 18 inch. You know, and I, I didn't know what I know now about barbecue or cooking, but that was the start. And when Chris and I got involved, my uh, business partner, you know, we're big sports fans. Uh, being here in St. Louis, we were spoiled with the Rams. We're not gonna talk about the Rams. Uh, the who? Exactly. Um, Cardinals and Blues, man. So we'd go down to our, one of our favorite watering holes and just talk sports and literally barbecue came up every time. So Chris and I, we started competing on the amateur side and we found out real quick that we were pretty quick learners. And that's really when it all started. Chris came up with our first three blends. Um, and the story goes that, you know, we put it in a bottle, threw some stickers on it. And that was the beginning of something we had literally no idea of where it was going. We, we always had a vision from day one mm -hmm. of where we were going. Um, but this thing literally took on a life of its own within the first, I'd say, uh, after 36 months of being in business, it was no longer a hobby. Okay. So before we go forward, I want to go back a little bit. I mean, you talked about cooking as, as a form, really. I mean, you didn't say it directly, but you almost touched on upon, upon it as a cooking is almost a form of therapy, right? A way to kind of get away. It's beyond therapeutic. And, yeah. and I think, you know, many people out there, you know, can relate to that statement. Um, it's a way to kind of clear the head, um, to get out, to do something different, especially during this quarantine, which we're in right now. Um, we're all locked inside with our families, which can be a gift, but too much of it can also go the other way. Um, so, but even, I want to step back even further to the moment when you decided to become a police officer out of college. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to that decision? I mean, I know you have a big following with first responders at Code 3, so tell us a little bit more about So here's a little tidbit. I, I didn't go to college to learn, like some kids. I went there to play baseball. Um, I was a pretty gifted um, individual when it came to being an athlete. Uh, you know, at my playing days in college, I was uh, 6'4", 225, and didn't have much of anything on me. My whole life was baseball from the time I was a little boy. Um, all I wanted to do was become a professional baseball player. My older brother, Bob, he's eight years older than me. He, played, he had time in the White Sox organization. Um, when he left... Um, professional baseball, he became a police officer. So there was a trend, you know, I always looked up to my brother and I always, my brother was a goalie in high school. I was a goalie in high school. Uh, my brother was a catcher. I was a catcher. He became a police officer. I wanted to become a police officer. And I would do ride alongs with him from the time I turned 18 and I was hooked. I mean, I remember like my first week on the job as a police officer, uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Davis, he's an awesome human being. I'll never forget this. I told him, I said, uh, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. And he just started laughing. Keep in mind, he's like a 20 year police vet. He sure. Was laughing his ass off. Laughing and, because <laughs> he knew you didn't know, really knew what well, you were getting man, into. I was green and, you know, I was just excited to play my part in society. You know, I couldn't believe that I got to drive around in a squad car and talk to people in the community and go uh, look for bad guys doing bad stuff. You know, it was just, it was a whole new world to me. You know, and that was a big appeal to me as far as law enforcement goes. But, um, you know, I went through a couple burnout phases as well. Um, you know, that's where a lot of police officers, you know, they don't tell you in the academy, you know, that they don't tell you about the divorce rate. They don't tell you about the suicide rate. They don't tell you about alcoholism rate or drug usage rate or PTSD. PTSD wasn't even talked about. I was wow. in the first academy class after 9-11 just to put it in perspective. Okay. So we, they didn't talk about that stuff in the academy. You know, um, just to sort of go into this, I have a, a neighbor, had a neighbor, um, young kid, 25, uh, had some twins, newly married. And he's like, man, I really want to become a cop. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't want to discourage a kid, but I want to tell him what I know now. And now with the media, the way it is, and the way society has changed, it's very tough to be a police officer nowadays. Ever since the Ferguson effect, it's been, um, you know, not, I don't want to go into the media issue on this 
first episode, but it posed a massive problem to today's law enforcement and how they were treating the perception from the public on the eye of law enforcement, how they handle things. Certainly. So, you know, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Without going too far into that, um, I can definitely see the challenges of being a police officer with some of the perceptions that are out there. And I think social media has expanded that. Um, I want to know, you know, as a police officer, you have to see some crazy right? Can you share with us just like a crazy story, an off the wall story, something that you saw that just kind of sits with you and resonates with you still to this day? Well, I mean, the that's the thing. It's you, you could be a cop in a town of 500 people nowadays, or you could be in New York City or New Orleans or Chicago or L.A. It doesn't matter where you're a cop. Things are going to happen no matter what. Um, <laughs> one of my earlier, my, my first pursuit was an eye opener. Uh, that was a wild one. High speed? Uh, it was high speed. Um, that was we'll save that story for another time. All right. Um, <laughs> All right. You know, obviously we had um, the Maryville Church shooting back in 2009, 2010. That was a pretty rough day. That's something we can go over at another time. Um, one incident that I'll never forget was it was in the middle of summer and it was one of those July evenings where it was like 85 degrees at one o'clock in the morning still. Okay. And it was just miserably hot yeah, and muggy I'm and humid. Thinking 85 and I'm wondering about the time frame. Yeah. It doesn't sound too bad for July. So, around here yeah there's this little hotel off the interstate and uh i was driving and i see this person i didn't know what gender it was um had black boots up to his knees had a black skirt on <laughs> and a black halter top and he had his hair in a ponytail and he had this handkerchief around his neck and he's riding this bike well he saw me i was like well i gotta go check this out so I'm creeping up to him and he starts pedaling real fast and I lose him around the corner of the hotel. Well, his door's cracked and I see what door he goes in. And I was like, hey man, I just wanna to talk to you real quick. And I'll give you the elevator version of this part. So I get his name, we run it. Criminal history comes back off the charts. Some dude out of Indiana. Um, he was getting so nervous when I was asking him specific questions that he bit the top of his lip and he bit a chunk of it off. And it's just sort of, dangling, bleeding. Wow. My, my uh, sergeant that was on, he was up at Madison County at the time. I had zero backup. So I said, you know, I was only two years on the street at this time, probably. And I had that gut feeling like, okay, you know, back off a little bit. I can revisit this here after I get hold of my sergeant, whatever. I let the front door staff know, you know, at the hotel. And four or five hours go by, I get hold of the surrounding cities and tell them. And, uh, Shares can be 11.30, midnight, whatever it was. We get a phone call saying that he's bothering patrons, this, that, and the other. <sighs> so I pull in the parking lot, and it's just a two-level hotel, and there's windows like this, mm -hmm. you know, basic hotel rooms, and the, everything was open. And this guy's wearing this get-up still, and he's just mumbling stuff at a high rate of speed. And... He sees me and he flips out and he's got this fanny pack on and he pulls out what looked to be like a revolver. Out of a fanny pack. Out of a fanny pack. <laughs> so by this time, uh, two neighboring cities were already en route. Um, a city north of us was just showing up on scene. And so basically, let's say if this is the window here, you, I was where you were, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm on this side and he pulls a gun and we're both drawn, sort of angled, but if we would have shot, it could have ricocheted off here and hit you or vice versa. Well, luckily we figured out that it was a fake gun because of the way the handle was. Mm -hmm. we, we noticed that after the oh crap factor, you know? So by that time, the cavalry was coming. Uh, I think we had four, four cities show up. We probably had 10, 12 units there. Um, and I'll caveat with, uh, basically he was a paranoid schizophrenic on methamphetamine. And, Doesn't uh, sound like a good combo. No, it's not a good combo. And you know, I'm I'm a pretty big dude. I'm six four. I was at that time probably two fifty, working out a lot. He was probably, if I remember correctly, five ten, maybe a buck seventy. Well, we had to kick the door in, and the fight was on. There's six cops in this room, and I've never seen anything like it. Me and another guy my size were on top of this guy, and the craziest thing was, 
you know, he, he probably had over 400 pounds of man on him. And he literally stood up and he said, I ain't going anywhere. And he ended up taking three taser rides, wow. um, a couple baton strikes to the leg, uh, mace, and a close range beanbag to the chest. And we finally got him handcuffed on the ground and we pulled out switchblades on each side in his boots. Um, he had, if I recall, I think it was a 40 caliber bullet uh, hidden in his underwear. Um, he had a switchblade tucked in back here. I mean, it was, it was off the charts. It was literally- Armed up. Yeah, dude, it was wild, you know? And at the time I was loving it. Right. You know? The thrill, is that when you say you loved it, was it the kind of the excitement of being in the moment? Well, I mean, that's part of it, I think, for most people. Um, when you've got other officers there with you, obviously safety is the main concern for everybody. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what we were dealing with. Um, this guy was ready to take us all on, you know, but this was the first time I ever transported a prisoner with lights and sirens to the county. And the next day I had an arrest in the afternoon, which was a Sunday, and I took my prisoner up to county and one of my good buddy jailers up there, Mike, he goes, you're not gonna believe this guy hasn't gone to bed since you brought him in. Really? So a lot of the story unfolded, but I mean, that was one of many, 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 many multiple crazy things. I could talk all day about crazy Certainly. stuff I saw. I have a friend of mine from high school um, who uh, was an officer in uh, St. Louis County and he ended up, I'll never forget the morning, I turned on the news and they were talking about officers that had been shot. And um, I was very sad to learn that one of them was my friend who uh, ended up uh, paralyzed and still yeah. in a wheelchair. So mm -hmm. um, some reality. exciting moments. I know there's a lot of danger out there and um, you know, it's, it's service we need in our communities. Um, unfortunately, there's, you know, like any part of the world, there's gonna be some bad actors and um, you know, to protect people's safety, um, we need heroes, really. People who are gonna go out there, risk life and limb for the preservation of society, the safety of society, and all its members. So Agreed. that's a great story. Um, can't wait to hear a couple other ones as this podcast moves along, but kinda, I wanna jump forward now into that moment. You're, you're in a bar, you're with Chris, you're having some drinks, and talk us through the ideation behind Code 3 Spices and, and share a little insight with that story because I do think that there's something very, very inspiring about someone who, you know, is willing to stretch their comfort zones. By, someone, by that, I mean someone who is a police officer who's now gonna go into business for themselves. And I think hearing your story will provide some inspiration maybe for others who are considering, you know, trying their hand at a business that they might not be familiar Here's with. Here's the reality of it. This thing has been like a blink of an eye to me. It hasn't been easy, um, but it has been Chris and I's baby. This is our extreme passion. Um, you know, it, when Chris, before Chris and I even signed our papers to corporate, um, we decided we're donating a percentage of every sale to first responder military organizations. Um, and I'll just hit on that real quick. So with me being thrown all that adversity, it only made sense because I made relationships with a couple PTSD groups that we were gonna help fund um, organizations that uh, provide um, resources to these men and women that need it. Thankfully, I was never in a position where I wanted to harm myself. Um, the weird thing for me was the amount of depression that I felt for the first time, uh, the anxiety that came with it, the unknown of being a single dad all of a sudden. Um, you know, my mom was getting put into a home. I was going through a divorce. My sister was passing away from cancer. Um, I, I had three miles of mud to crawl through is the way it felt every day. And, you know, that's... That's probably been the biggest takeaway from all this. It's uh, really helped form who I am. Um, it's matured some of my beliefs that I already had instilled in me. That sort of uh, gave it uh, some credence to, you know, how you should live your life. Mm -hmm. um, but with that said, you know, it's uh, one of those deals where with us giving back to these organizations, one, it's the right thing to do, but two, I have met so many people throughout this journey 
that have had it much worse than me, um, that do have suicidal thoughts, um, they're going through such a time in their life that they're not being a healthy individual for their uh, mate, girlfriend, husband, kids, whatever the situation is. Um, a lot of cops have their, and first responders in general, they, they see a lot of things people see that you're not supposed to see as a human being. Right. And that catches up with you. So, you know, that's just sort of the nutshell version of why we donate. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we have backstoppers here, which you know about. You know, anytime there's a, a fallen first responder, they come in and they're an incredible organization. They are. And they're amazing people, too. And you guys, I'll toot your own horn. You guys, uh, Code 3 Spices donates a, a usually a pretty good sized check every year at their Guns and Hoses. It's, it's their signature event, which happens in St. Louis. It's uh, police officers versus firefighters mm -hmm. in a boxing ring. And you guys are always there handing out a check. Yeah. Um, you know, and. With that said, that, that's what's cool about this. So, I mean, we get to go to bed at night knowing that we're giving our heart and soul growing this company, not for self-gratification, but for our community and the men and women performing duties that no one else in this country would even think about doing. You know, and let's not even talk about what they're getting paid. Right. Okay. That goes for teachers. That goes for a lot of, a lot of people. But that was the gist of Code 3 Spices. You know, Chris, Chris is the head competition guy for the company. Um, you know, so you don't see me a lot anymore on the competition trail. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Chris's deal. That's his baby. He's running with it. He's one of the top cooks in the country, whether it's steak or whatever he's competing. You know, we have a barbecue supply. Um, we've got a lot of different wheels in motion. So, you know, I have my kids every other weekend. So um, there's two weekends out of the month that it's just me and the kids and that's dad and kid time. Um, that's not go out and play and compete or hang out with the guys. Uh, Chris and I stay extremely busy enough to where, you know, any downtime for me is, um, it's very important. So fast forward to now, that's sort of where we're at now. It's, um, with, the, with this thing taking on a life of its own, it's, it's become really incredible, to be honest with you. Yeah, that, it is incredible. It's incredible to see businesses growing and succeeding, and you guys have, by all measures, achieved a lot of success. And for everyone at home or anyone who's listening, I, who maybe has that idea in their head, I, I want to kind of dig in a little bit more on that origin story. So, you, you know, you meet Chris. How do you guys go from there? You know, you have this idea from, uh, to create a, uh, a spice, the spice market is uh, competitive, at least from my perception. So can you walk us through a little bit about the ideation stage of the company? Is it Chris has a rub, you guys see some opportunity there? Uh, tell us a little bit more. Well, first off, I mean, me and Chris were so madly in love with barbecue to begin with. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do anything else moving forward. That was, that was easy, you know, but I was having a really bad night. Uh, on a, a midnight shift one time and things had died down. It was about three o'clock in the morning. I was like, man, what can we call this? You know, when things were going, I was talking to my buddy, Steve, that was a police officer in the town next door. And I was like, code three is perfect. We'll call it code three spices just because it's an, you know, basically an international term of first responders going to a, an emergency call. So I figured, well, you know, that'll, that'll cover a wide array of all this. Absolutely. And then I was thinking, well, what about logo? You know, well, basically, if you look at our logo, we took an old Bud Light beer can, reversed everything, and just put Code 3 Spices in the middle. And we had red for fire, blue for police, so there was our red and blue. Your branding's on um, point. And then spicing it up for those who serve with us donating back. Um, so that's really how that all got started. Um, but honestly, you know, there's, um, throughout this whole thing, there's only been a handful of people that were like, you're crazy for doing this, you know, whatever. Um, and you're going to get that with anything that you want to put your best foot forward with. Um, that was really how it started. And then, brother, we just went full force. We don't take any days. We haven't taken any days off for years. Um, both Chris and I, this has been our baby. You know, I left law enforcement. He left his job. And it's been two people busting our balls from the time we get up to the time we go to bed for the last seven and a half years. So do you consider that the key ingredient to your success is the work ethic or what? No, the I don't. That I think, that? um, cause here's the deal. 
we are, you mentioned it earlier, we are in a very highly competitive industry. You walk in any grocery store and you've got Durkee, McCormick, Sweet Baby Rage, you've got a plethora, uh, a full row of spices and sauce now, right? Uh, we knew what we were getting into, but we also did our homework and reached out to some pretty important people in our industry like Sweet Baby Ray, um, who's a very, very dear friend of mine that I look up to. Um, you know, so to stay on track, you know, I think that it was just well received because uh, people could see our passion about how much we love cooking and how, how much passion me and Chris put into our products. I mean, we don't rush anything to market. You know, this is attached to us. This is attached to our last names. We're very prideful people. Um, but the key to our success is really embracing the tough times as a startup company um, because it humbles you. Um, Absolutely. The other key is me and Chris have never given up. We've always been positive. Um, we've always thought outside the box. But here's the main ingredient that, here's the main ingredient for me and Chris's success. It has to have, you, you, you have to have the purpose behind your mission. Abs 100% agree. So the very first real experience I had was probably six years ago. I got a phone call from um, a police officer out in California. And he said, hey, I just saw one of your posts on Facebook about Safe Call Now, who we donate to. And he goes, I called that hotline. And he goes, my wife was on the phone with me. And they got me into treatment. And he goes, two days ago, I had a gun in my mouth. You know, so that was when it first hit me like, okay, we are getting out there. We are making a difference. You know, that's just one of many, many stories now, you know, but um, perseverance is key. Just like I said, crawling through the mud, um, whether it was me trying to overcome my obstacles with depression and anxiety um, or just growing a business. I mean, business isn't easy, period. I mean, check it out. It dude. is not. We've been in business almost eight years and we are literally just getting started. You know, I have a couple people that I really look up to, uh, Chris Klein and Andy Frisella from First Form and Supplement Superstores. And they were kind enough to sit down with me and Chris. Dude, this has been almost six years, I think. And I'll never forget that meeting because it was so raw and real that it was inspiring just in the sense that they took the time to sit down with us. You know, and to look back, to see where we've evolved into now, um, it's very self-gratifying because uh, I, Chris and I are so busy that we don't have time to be like, oh, look at us, look what we've accomplished, look what we just did, look at all these stories, whatever it is. We don't have time for it because we planted so many seeds from day one that each day, each week, each month, we're dealing with a new tree that has popped up from planting that seed. So we've diversified from day one. That's another key to our success. But the other key to our su success is having products that are off the charts. You know, um, a lot of guys throw a bunch of stuff in a bottle, put a label on it with no thought, and say, oh, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna become a millionaire doing this. It doesn't work like that. You've gotta sell thousands of bottles daily to be profitable in this industry. I mean, check well, I just wanna stop you right there and share with everyone how I met Mike and Chris was at the National Barbecue and Grilling Association Conference, um, I think about two years ago now. And you guys had given a presentation on some of your background as a company. The next day, they had a group of some real big name pros uh, who were on the stage in uh, sort of a, I guess I'll call it a fireside chat for lack of a better way. And one of the questions they got are, what are some of the steps that we need to take to start our own spice company? This was coming from people in the audience. And every single one of them said, do not do it. It's too crowded of a space. There's other challenges to getting into big box retailers and everything else. So I always find that, I always kind of mentally go back to that and find that very inspiring that we have a bunch of pros out there saying, don't do this, right? Now, maybe some of that is for their own benefit because they don't want new competitors in their space. But to hear about the story and the path you guys that walk to create a name for yourself in this space is absolutely tremendous. How many stores are you guys in right now? Oh, I think we're approaching 3,000 maybe. And I know we're adding 1,500 aces this year. Um, we've got a lot on the books for the rest of the year to get into. But it's funny though, because you touched on that. So like, 
this is what's awesome about our industry is everybody gets along, everybody supports each other. You know, we've got a barbecue supply, so we're selling our best buddies' products too. Right. We're not just selling our stuff. We're not the only kids on the block. You know, all boats rise together. So we, we all love cooking and barbecue. We, we love that community. It's one of the best communities out there. Um, but what I want to touch on was like what you were saying about when people say that the industry crowded this, that, or the other. We don't, this is our baby. We don't have anything else. We put so much time into this company. This is all we know. Um, we have too many people supporting us. Um, fear of failure is at an all time high. Um, and that's ingrained into me and Chris right now because you know, people come up to us and, you know, the popularity individually or business wise has really, really been out of control over the last couple of years. But at the end of the day, it's just two guys that love barbecue that have this desire to be the best in the industry. And also at the end of the day, we're already seeing this unfold. We're seeing companies not do exactly what we do, but they're wanting to give back. So we're trying to to be a leader in our industry. There's nobody else in the grocery stores doing what we're doing. Right. Not to our level. Yeah. You know, and that's probably what we're most proud of. But the sky's really the limit with it, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell. Yeah, as you say, it's been eight years and we're just getting warmed up. I hear that in Al Pacino's voice kind of screaming, it. <laughs> we're just getting warmed up here. Yeah, we so, are. But you know, you talked about your passion for barbecue. And so, you know, we've all been there. We're, we're just sitting around the grill for the first time, the second time. Um, and, you know, there's a learning curve. So how did you learn? Was it through trial and error? Was it through kind of talking with buddies, having them over? What's a, little, what's a little bit about the story behind the passion and the process? A lot of it was good? trial and error, man. But, I mean, ever since the Internet, man, with Google and all these cooking shows on TV now, Barbecue, Pitmasters, American Grill, Steve Reichlin, the list goes on and on. That's where I was hooked. You know, I, I look at barbecue, you mentioned barbecue's therapeutic. It's very therapeutic to me, but it's almost like a full circle religious experience for me. Because one, I think one of the best things a human being can do for another person is feed them. So when you go and you pick out whatever you're gonna cook, you're checking that out, right? You're buying your certain spices, you're lighting the charcoal up. You see the fire ignite, you see the charcoal catch, you smell the charcoal, which is an amazing smell. It'd be cool if we can like bottle that up and use it right. as like a man perfume, right? Um, you know, you get your coals going, you get your meat on the grill. And if you're grilling, you hear the sizzle. I mean, there's all these sounds and uh, smells. Yeah, you forgot one very important sound, the sound of that beer. <laughs> yeah, there you go, you got it. Speaking of. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's good. Real good. But, you know, that's part of the therapeutic part of it for me is you've got sort of this downtime. You're, you're, you have to pay very close attention to detail with that piece of meat or whatever you're cooking because there's a lot of science behind barbecue. That's why I think a lot of chefs don't really like messing with barbecue because it's sort of out of their realm. There is a lot of science behind it. But at the end of your cook, you get to, you put all this hard work and time and energy into this, you know, cooking ordeal where now, Joe, here you go, buddy, take a bite. I'm, I'm nourishing your body right. with barbecue. Absolutely. You know, how much more American can you get than that? I mean, that's what community is. And that's what I love about barbecue. That's why I say it is sort of a religious experience because, you know, like it's smoking on Maine. You see all these people out there with their families, their neighbors are sitting down, having a drink, kids are playing riding rides, doing whatever. It's all about community. Yeah. That's why I love everything about barbecue. It's the old saying, no one has friends over to microwave, right? <laughs> yeah, true we're, point. We're all there to, uh, you know, it, it, the food, like this show, the food is what kind of brings everyone to the table. There's a community aspect to it, as you mentioned. Um, you talked about smoking on main. I think people listening to us for the first time aren't familiar with that. What is smoking on main? Uh, basically, we're literally a half block maybe full block away from Main Street here in Collinsville. Uh, we shut down five, six blocks, and we have about 100 teams come in from all over the U.S. Uh, to do a backyard event, a uh, pro event, and a state competition association event, SCA. 
Uh, we have bands, we have kids rides, we have Anheuser-Busch Clydesdales, we've got um, all kinds of different things going on. And this will be the fourth year. Now, I don't know where we're at because of Corona right now. Right. Um, we should hear something here pretty soon about that. But I know that the first year was a learning experience. It turned out good. Um, it allowed us to know what we needed to work on for the following mm -hmm. year. Uh, the city's been tremendous. This, this whole this town is just unbelievable to begin with. They really support Code 3 and everything we're doing. Um, but I think last year, I think we had we estimated anywhere from 50 to 60,000 in attendance. So it's become sort of a destination competition in the Midwest. Yeah, it was a great event. You had the competition barbecue guys. As you mentioned, you had the State Cook-Off Association event. And the interesting thing about that was, if I recall correctly, the guy who won that event had never competed in a competition. It Not was once. literally his first yeah. cook. Yep. And that, to me, was really inspiring, you mm -hmm. know, that, uh, that there's still a lot of opportunity out there for people who want to compete in the competitive barbecue and grilling space. Yep. Why don't we uh, why don't we tell the people sort of what to expect from Meat America? Explore the methods and recipes for cooking meat in restaurants across America as we showcase experts on location in their restaurant kitchens to educate, inspire, and entertain. Tune in to our travel cooking show, Meet America, only on YouTube and redmeatlover.com. I mean, yeah, I mean, from, from my view, it's a way to uh, share, you know, let me step back. When I went up to National Barbecue and Grilling Association, and I met experts from all across the country, from Texas to Kansas City to the Carolinas, um, the one thing that really dawned on me was that sense of brotherhood, was that sense of community that was out there. You had the guys from Texas sharing barbecue tips with the folks from Kansas City, from the folks from the Carolinas and so on and so forth. And it was really neat to me to see that humility among the pros. And so one of the things that, you know, one of my goals for this show is to be able to bring those experts to our audience to share with them. I think that there's no faster pathway to becoming good at something than piggyback, piggybacking off of the failures yeah. of uh, not where people have messed up, right? Why do I need to go out and recreate the same mistake that someone's already made when I can learn from that and get a, a leap forward. The other part of it is, is that, you know, uh, I think there's always a story to tell, right? Uh, outside of the pit masters, there's a lot of really, uh, there's a lot of things that really tie back that make us uniquely American, talk about our culture, and that really resides in the stories and in the people. And so, you know, my heart wants to bring some of those people, some of those guests uh, to our audience to share their great stories. Um, across a myriad of professions and backgrounds, things that uh, will hopefully people will find some inspiration in, hopefully things that people will find some humor in as Absolutely. well. So really looking forward to that and also sharing, you know, uh, sharing great products that are out there um, is, a, you know, something that I think can accelerate your pathway to success, right? Well, Just knowing the tools, right? I, you're not, you're not going to be a great carpenter if you only have a hammer and nails. It takes well, that's that. the thing, man. I mean, if you follow any of our Instagram stories, I mean, I'm using all my buddy's products. I'm not just using my stuff. You know, so that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited to get exposure to a lot of people in our industry that we really admire as far as them personally and their products. Um, I'm really excited to get Chris on here and spread the knowledge that that dude has. Absolutely. Um, I'm pretty good at the cooking game and I know what I'm doing, but Chris is just on another level when it comes to the competition side that I'm not. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about getting some of the top pit masters in the country on this podcast. Um, we've also got a lot of uh, surprises up our sleeve for the people that we can't talk about yes. as far as guests go, which is going to be pretty cool. So at the end of the day, that's sort of uh, uh, the beginning of something bigger than we thought was going to be, which is Meet America. Yeah. And I forgot to say, it's just a lot of fun. It is. Too. You know, I think you said it one time best, if we can get it, uh, get up every day and talk about barbecue and right. grilling, that's a pretty damn good life. So I mean, look, man, I've had a great time chatting with you on this first uh, episode. I look get used to it, dude. We got yeah. a lot to go. Yeah. I look forward to many more to go. I want to thank everyone at home uh, and uh, who's seeing this on YouTube for checking us out today. So please stay tuned. We got a lot of great things. Mike, if someone wants to buy uh, Code 3 Spices or any Spices barbecue gear, how can they find you around the web? Yeah, you can go to Code3Spices.com or if you want to shop our storefront, you can go to Code3BarbecueSupply.com. Um, we usually ship within 24 hours and uh, make sure to follow us on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, we're very active on Instagram on our stories. Uh, we post a lot of how-to tutorials as well. 
Um, but that's where you can find us. Okay, and uh, you can find me uh, at redmeatlover.com or on YouTube by just typing in Red Meat Lover. We release a new video every single week. Typically, it revolves around uh, my food journey as I've you know, gone through the process of being new around the grill to where I'm at today, but we also have a very exciting program that will be launching in September. So anyway, look forward to the next episode, brother. Right on. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel at redmeatlover.com and learn more at meetamericapodcast.com. Yeah.